Good morning, everyone. And I'm very pleased to see you on Zoom and in person. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping to start with. I want to remind everybody that we still have two speakers coming up. Uh, one is Dr. John Block, who will talk about the evolution of mammals, but specifically primates. Uh, I think that should be, since we are primates, in fact, as homo sapiens, that should be of interest to a lot of people. And then uh, our final lecture is Dr. Richard Hulbert, who uh, will be talking about the ancient animals of Florida. Um, and if you've been to the Florida Museum yet, uh, you'll notice that our fossil hall doesn't have dinosaurs because there were no dinosaurs in Florida. <laughs> um, and uh, Dr. Hulbert is the uh, chief of pre preparation of fossils. Uh, I've known him from times that I was working in the lab. So Dr. Anita Marshall was originally give, uh, scheduled to give this presentation. She was unexpectedly invited last weekend to the USGS Hawaii Volcano Observatory as the huge volcano Mauna Loa was becoming active and expected to begin a large scale eruption. Dr. Marshall, well, she teaches dinosaurs, is a volcanologist, and this was an opportunity too good to pass up, she said apologetically. So she enlisted her, uh, her teaching assistant, Sarah Lynn Redding, uh, a PhD student in the Department of Geological Sciences. And for three years, she has been Dr. Marshall's teaching assistant and co-lecturer for the semester course on the Mesozoic Age of Dinosaurs. Sarah's interest is both in science, technology, and engineering, and math, STEM, and in volcanic minerals. In her PhD research, she is focusing on potential causes of disconnects between the expectations of UF geology students and their professors. That sounds pretty rich. Her undergraduate degree in anthropology is from Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton, and she completed the coursework towards a master's degree in anthropology and interdisciplinary social science. She has had considerable experience teaching and tutoring students at FAU and Daytona State College who were struggling and at risk of dropping out. So I hope you will welcome Sarah Redding. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. getting everything set up. Okay. So, that's perfect. So today we're going to be talking about the Mesozoic world, specifically the landscapes, the ecosystems, and the changes that occurred during the Mesozoic era, during the age of dinosaurs, as we're familiar with it. And I don't think anything captures that idea better than the picture of the three different globes on the screen right now. So in the first one, we're at the start of the Mesozoic era, and you see the supercontinent Pangaea. It's completely together. There's no separations in it. You have a large ocean covering the majority of Earth at the time, the Panthalassa Sea. And there's some islands here and there around in the oceans. During the Mesozoic, however, Pangaea broke up and it broke into lots of different pieces. And by the Jurassic, halfway through the Mesozoic era, we're in this middle globe where you can actually see the beginnings of things like the southern edge of South America and Florida covered with water instead of in being dry land. By the end of the Mesozoic era, we're going to be in the time frame called the Cretaceous period. And by that point, the globe doesn't actually look that different from what it does today. The changes at the tectonic level made for all of the differences we see in life, at least to some great extent, because you can't change from having one giant supercontinent to having all the small little continents without creating a lot of new habitats and getting rid of a lot of the life that had previously been there. So just to give everybody an idea of where we're going and how we're going to get there today, I'm going to first talk a little bit about myself to frame why I do geology. 
And then I'm going to set the stage for the start of the Mesozoic era. From there, we're going to talk about the three periods of interest, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. And we're going to briefly cover where's Florida during each step, what was the overall climate of Earth during those time frames? What was the flora? What was the fauna? Then we're going to cover why the Mesozoic era ended to the best of current scientific thought. And then I'm going to give some final caveats because I'm a scientist and there's not a lot of certainty in science and it's a really big thing when I say something certain. So I want to be very clear with where we have limits. So why dinosaurs, why geology? Well, the big thing for me was that I traveled a lot as a kid and traveling, I got to see a lot of different interesting types of outcrops. So all of these pictures, except for this bottom one, are images I took as a 10 year old, 12 year old, 14 year old on summer trips with my family. On one of those trips, I got to go to a place called Clayton Lake. And Clayton Lake is world famous for having some of the most extensive dinosaur fossil tracks found anywhere. In fact, these fossil tracks that I had on the previous slide are from Clayton Lake. And then during the summer before my senior year of my undergraduate program, I actually got to go on a paleontology dig in New Mexico with the Mesa Land Museum, which is a very large fossil museum that has life-size casts of most of the major dinosaur discoveries in New Mexico and around the world. And while we were there, I was part of opening up six new dig sites at our site location. And we discovered amphibians that had teeth. And it was really an interesting part of my journey to becoming a geologist. So setting the stage for the start of the Mesozoic, Earth began the Mesozoic era covered in that giant Panthalassa ocean. The continent was Pangaea and it was a supercontinent. But while it was a supercontinent stretching from both the North Pole all the way to the South Pole, that doesn't mean that the ecosystems were homogenous. They weren't all the same. Instead, there were a lot of different ecosystems. And at the end of the Permian, prior to the start of the Triassic, there was a massive extinction level event called the Great Dying. During the extinction level event, roughly 90% of life on Earth died over a very short period of time. And we only had 5% of the existing marine life survive and about a third of what was on land. Now, we don't understand why the Great Dying occurred. It is far enough back in our fossil record that we don't necessarily have the best evidence to say what happened. And there were a lot of different theories that have been proposed over the years as to what might have occurred, some of them being a massive impact. We don't have a crater that would give us that indication. Some have said maybe it was the Siberian traps, which are a massive area covered in Siberia, covered in volcano volcanic debris and the volcanic eruptions they think might have introduced enough gas to our atmosphere to make it very toxic and have changed the chemistry of the ocean so that there is a lot of anoxic events so no oxygen available to support the life that was in the oceans at the time and those massive traps they were hundreds to thousands of miles wide and they are multiple miles thick as well so it was a very long very well preserved indication of what could have happened but we're not sure that that was the entire day of the story but it left open a lot of places in the fossil record where things disappeared. And that means that on land and on sea, when things disappeared, there were a lot of new places for life to appear. So leaving the Permian, we enter into the Triassic and we are going to go through the Triassic, which was about 252 million years to 200 million years ago. Then into the Jurassic, which was 200 to 145 million years ago. And finally into the Cretaceous, which was 145 to 66 million years ago. And these three spans of time 
are ginormous. So we won't cover every single type of dinosaur or all the different types of life forms that were around, but we will cover a decent broad overview of them to the best of my abilities. And one of the things I want to point out is most people think of the Mesozoic and they say, oh, the age of dinosaurs. But they weren't just the age of dinosaurs. This was the age of conifers, massive, ginormous conifer forests. This was the age of reptiles. The beginning of the Mesozoic, we didn't have that many dinosaurs. By the end of the Mesozoic, we had a lot of other things happening too. So where were we at that time? Well, Florida is here at the equator, part of the central mass of Pangaea. And the nice thing about these maps is they actually have the current outline in white. And then what we think was dry land at the time is in the shades of green and brown to represent what the climate was like. And you can see that there are ginormous parts of Pangaea that are covered in yellowy brown spots indicating that they were covered in massive deserts. But the deserts weren't the entirety of the story. We also had those vast conifer forests that I mentioned, and the trees in the conifer forests reached up to 100 foot tall, and there were also areas covered with fern prairies, and we also had mosses, scale trees like palm trees, and ginkgos. Ginkgos being at the time a large group of different types of trees, even though today they're only survived by the one variety of ginkgo balboa. We don't have flowers and grasses yet. So if you went on that walk through the prairie, you weren't going to come across wildflowers. You weren't going to have pollen coming from grasses. Instead, it was going to be ferns. And the plants in the northern and the southern part of Pangaea weren't identical. You had variations as you went through different areas and you had slightly different temperatures. But the climate was primarily hot and dry. We did have those massive deserts and it played a big role in what was present. So what type of animals were present? Well, if we look at the non-dinosaurs, we had a variety of small reptiles that were mammal-like. Um, the most famous one is the herbivorous synapsid Lystrosaurus, which is drawn semi to scale here. So this is what it would have looked like compared to a two, foot, a two meter tall human, so roughly six feet tall. And waist height with some of them being knee height. You also had amphibians, but the amphibians of that day were not our frogs or newts. Instead, they looked like crocodiles, and while unrelated, they could be as tiny as our common frogs, all the way up to crocodilian-sized, nine-meter-long amphibians. You also had the first of the ichthyosaurs, which were a variety of reptile that at one point ended up ruling the seas. They early on did not look like dolphins of today, but over time they evolved to looking like that. And this is one of the varieties that did look more dolphin-like by the end of the Triassic, and it was roughly six feet long. There were also plesiosaurs in the waters and fish, and your normal range of bivalves, shelled animals that we see today. Around 228 million years ago, the first pterosaurs appeared and took to the skies. And they were a type of reptile that at their greatest extent were more massive than anything that covers the skies today. And we'll get there. If we look at the ruling reptiles of the time, these ruling reptiles had a variety of sizes going to about three, four meters long with the smallest being under two, well, yeah, under two meters. They were the common ancestors to the crocodiles and the dinosaurs and what became the birds. They were broken into two groups, the ornithosuchia, which included the dinosaurs, the pterosaurs, and later birds, and the pseudosuchias, which included the croc-like phytosaurs and some armadillo-like aetosaurs. 
around 240 million years ago, which was during the Triassic, the very first dinosaurs that were true dinosaurs appeared in the fossil record. And they were part of that Ornithuchia clade. They were small and bipedal originally, but they quickly split into two different groups, the Saurischia, which became the sauropods, and the Ornithosclida, I can't pronounce that word, sorry guys, <laughs> which included theropods and Ornithischians. The theropods are the type of dinosaurs we think of when we're thinking of velociraptors and T-Rexes, but they weren't originally that size. So this gives you an indication of the size of the Triassic dinosaurs. So during the rise of the dinosaurs, the Ornithischians had hips like modern bird hips. There were carnivorous varieties and herbivorous varieties, differing with length of neck based off of what type of food they ate. And then you had the Ceritians, which had hips that were more similar to the reptile hips we're used to. And all of them were herbivorous, but they had grinding teeth and non-grinding teeth. Rheosaurus was pretty massive. It was one of the herbivorous Ceritians. Isanosaurus was another one. And this is a juvenile member of the Isanosaurus. Based off of the fossils we have found, they probably got a lot bigger as they got older, but we actually don't have a complete skeleton of an older Isanosaurus. The Ornistitians were pretty tiny in my opinion. This is one of the smaller carnivorous varieties, but they were all pretty much shorter than waist height on an average human. And on all of these slides, ladies and gentlemen, when there is a human being next to them, I'm trying to make all of the dinosaurs actually the same size. So I'm using the humans in the pictures to give you a size range so you can actually compare the size of the dinosaurs that you see. Or the pterosaurs, because I include pictures with pterosaurs like this as well. So going into the Jurassic, we had those dinosaurs, but things started to shake up. The supercontinent Pangaea started to split. And as it split, it created a lot of new environments for things to live. Florida starts to submerge at this time. And you can see that there's barely any green left here. And once it submerges during the Jurassic, it stays submerged up until closer to modern times. So we won't see it really show up again. And the fossils we recover from Florida during the Mesozoic are pretty much entirely relegated to things that would have come from the bottom of an ocean. So we have a lot of limestones and that's why the foot of Florida is a limestone foot. You also have another small extinction that takes place here at the boundary between the Triassic and the Jurassic. This allowed dinosaurs to flourish in areas where other animals had previously survived. And this map is showing the late Jurassic. So you would have gone from that very together Pangaea to about where it looks like in this picture during the time frame that we consider the Jurassic 200 to 145 million years. 55 million years of time is a lot of time for this type of change to take place. But it happened pretty fast, geologically speaking. So what was the climate like? Well, with the newly formed inland seas, we started to have a warmer, more tropical feel to the earth. We have lush vegetation covering the majority of land and that vegetation dominating the majority of land gave a lot of new areas for things to take over. Our plants were palm tree-like cycads. We had conifers, which included the sequoias and the redwoods that are still around today. We had ginkgo still. And there were giant tree ferns that were multiple meters high, or taller than humans. And this changing landscape with its temperate and tropical forests had a low seasonality, meaning that we didn't have summers and winters that were extremes of each other, with very cold periods in the winter and very warm periods in the summer. And that's thought to be because of the amount of water that was suddenly found inland, replacing what had once been deserts. So these inland seas and large oceans had a lot of room for new types of life forms, but the old ones were still present for the most part. And so you still see things like the ichthyosaurs, which were very fish-like. 
Um, you also had long necked plesiosaurs, which are these guys. And you had marine crocodiles. You had modern sh looking sharks and rays. And you also had giant fish, like this guy in the bottom, and different types of cephalopods and ammonites. This was also known as the golden age of dinosaurs. So all of those different places that were available to take over, they did. And they did it rapidly with great sauropods that were so tall that they would be filling the entire length of this room and then some. You had the Camarasaurs, Diplodocus, Brachiosaurs, lots of others. And the Ornistitians really separated out into those theropods and the non-theropods that were herbivorous. And you had the Stegosaurs became very common during this period. And there's evidence that some of the dinosaurs like Iguanodons were around too. The large theropods were not yet at their maximum size, but they were still pretty big. So these are the sauropods. So compared to our six foot tall person, all of a sudden the screen is all dinosaur instead. <laughs> so we have the large brachiosaurs, which were one of the tallest, and then your diplodocus and chimerosaurus. And even with them being so tall, so long, there's evidence in the fossil record that they still had to get up on their tippy toes occasionally and throw their bodies, massive bodies up into the air and try to reach higher because the trees were so tall then. I mean, we're talking about redwoods and the leaves being super high up in the air. These guys were trying to eat them. The Ornistician herbivores were those stegosaurs, but we also had little things like leithsothors and because you guys would not really be able to see any details if I did them at their actual size. This is the actual size of the Lysothorus. It's a tiny little chicken <laughs> compared to the ginormous Stegosaurus. And they had a wide variety of Stegosaurus at this time. Um, this is just one generic example for you guys to enjoy. In terms of our theropods, well, I said they got pretty big. They're taller than most humans now and taller than dogs. They definitely were excellent carnivores and very fearsome. There were other things though that were equally big. We also have other types of animals present during the Jurassic. Just because it's their Jurassic doesn't mean that it was all dinosaurs. In the air, we have the pterosaurs and they were getting pretty common and you could have some that were as small as a foot and others that had up to a 16 foot wingspan, pretty big. And here's two examples of them. You also had mammals flourishing. And those mammals were even some of the earliest types of placental mammals that we're finding in the fossil record. And they were frequently going after insects that were continuing to evolve in the background. The first birds that evolved from small dinosaurs show up in the fossil record during the Jurassic. And the best known example of that one is the Archaeopteryx, which had beautiful wings that we could actually see because of the fossil imprints left behind in the rocks. So moving on to the Cretaceous. Between the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, there was a tiny, in geologic terms, extinction event. It did open up some more rooms for creatures to evolve into new habitats that they hadn't been in before. But this is really the era of the ginormous, terrifying lizards. And at this time, Florida is entirely submerged. The planet has continued to get warmer, more humid, more tropical feeling, both in the northern and the southern reaches. There is no Gulf Stream current yet which means that we're not creating a major temperature gradient from the poles to the equator. And we need a temperature gradient to really start getting strong seasonality. So while seasonality has increased, it's not to the point that we would expect commonly. And the land was primarily going to be either part of Laurasia at the start of the Cretaceous or part of Gondwana in the south. And here you're seeing it once it's even further broken up, but this is a map of the late Cretaceous rather than the early Cretaceous.
So what were the Cretaceous plants and climate like? I've already said seasonality low. It's starting to cool, but we still have a greenhouse conditions. We have a lot of nor near shore habitats forming because we keep getting more coastlines and the rifting continues. And the primordial woods are still around, but they start to become more like what we expect in a modern woods if we went walking in the woods here in Florida or in Georgia. Ginkgos, ferns, conifers, cycads, they persist through this time frame all the way to modern time. There are regional differences. And because the land is no longer one continuous piece, you start to see those regional differences becoming bigger because they're no longer able to mix the genetics as easily and readily as they had been. More importantly than all of that, in my opinion, the Cretaceous was the age of the angiosperms. It is the first time in the fossil record we get flowers. And with flowers, we get fruit. And with flowers and fruit, insects take off in a way they haven't had to in millions of years and all of a sudden to get to specialize to become bees and butterflies and moths. The angiosperms, once they appear, diversify and spread rapidly across the entire globe. And the new opportunities for food beyond just helping insects also help the small mammals and the small birds of the time. The pictures that I have here, this is what some of the earliest flowers is thought to have looked like, but this is actually a fossil from South America of the Montesquieu Vidali. And that was one of the earliest flowering plants that we have evidence of, and it was an aquatic plant. So there's reasons to believe that aquatic plants first developed the ability to be flowering and later spread onto land. So what about life in the oceans? We have a lot of oceans, we have a lot of sea, and we have a lot of sea life because of it. So our ammonites and the belemnites and other mollusks and fish they're around, they stay around. But they're being hunted by larger sea reptiles like our plesiosaurs. We have dolphin-like ichthyosaurs, but that's only until the mid-Cretaceous when suddenly they die out and we don't really know why. Mosasaurs, like the one that's in this picture, spread and diversify, filling the niche that the ichthyosaurs left behind. We also have enormous marine turtles, which are one of my favorites, like the Archelon, which was the size of a car and it's the picture that I have here at the top. And you can see it alongside a mosasaur to kind of get a feel for just how massive the mosasaurs were. We also have clams that are growing as big as 10 feet across and a lot of other things taking place on land. But above the land in the air, we're having more insects, like I said, and the long-tailed pterosaurs that had been present during the late Triassic and through the Jurassic start to go extinct, but larger pterosaurs arrive on the scene, including the famous Quetzalcoatlus, which is what this image is of. And the Quetzalcoatlus was a pretty massive pterosaur, bigger than any birds we have modernly. And there's been a lot of debate looking at the fossils. Could it fly? Do you guys think it flew? It's kind of a waste of wings and hollow bones if it didn't. So how did it get off the ground? Some people thought that maybe it would take off it with a running start and just leap into the ground eventually if it got up enough speed. But okay, there was a lot of forest that doesn't make sense. So what they think based off of new research that's coming out of merging aerodynamics with paleontology is that what they probably did was have really strong muscles in their legs and be able to jump straight up into the air eight feet. And once they were eight feet in the air, they actually gave them enough room to spread their wings and take off. So cool things coming out of geology. Birds also experienced their first major radiation into all the little niches left behind by the previous extinction and all the new niches that are appearing because of more insects and flowers. But those birds didn't look like our birds of today. This is a pretty good example for it. At a distance, you could look at that and go, oh, that actually looks kind of like maybe a dove, but it had claws at the end of its wings still, and its beak had teeth. So <laughs> crocodiles, we live in Florida, I have to mention crocodiles. Crocodiles of this time frame, some of them had banana-sized teeth. They were able to go up against T-Rexes and win. 
things get too close to the water, chomp, gone. So the close relatives of the crocodiles were very successful during the Cretaceous. They ruled the semi-aquatic realms, happily moving back and forth between the land and the seas. The one that's in the illustration is called the Alphadon, and it really did have banana-sized heat. That's one of the most easily recovered artifacts we have of them. True snakes show up on the scene during the Cretaceous, but they're not diversified yet. So you have a couple varieties and not much. Mammals, however, diversify. They take advantage of all the new food sources. Monotremes and marsupials appear in the fossil record. And we have early rodent-like animals that they look like rodents, but they aren't, and they don't continue past the Cretaceous. The two that are here in the screen are a... I can't pronounce this one easily. Sorry, guys. Um, one of them is the Cephaliodon wakmurushish. <laughs> and it was a two and a half pound rabbit sized animal, um, about the size of a very small hare. And they were really happy at this time, screwing around the feet of dinosaurs. The dinosaurs most of the time ignored them, and they got a lot of food out of the new bugs. What about the dinosaurs, though? Well, those iguanodons that I mentioned might have shown up in the Jurassic. They really take off in the Cretaceous. And they're nice three meters tall if we're just looking at the height, but they're a very long 10 meters. The T-Rex shows up, and some might have been larger than the one that's in this picture, which is about four meters tall, which would be about 12 feet tall. There were some that were smaller because you would have dealt with some juvenile T-Rexes. You also have the Centrosaurus, which is a early Ceratopsian. Thing is, the Ceratops did not exist prior to the Cretaceous. So when you get the Ceratops, they show up, they take over the scene for a bit, being very cool with the Triceratops, and then they disappear and are extinct by the end of the Cretaceous. But the ceratops, while they're there, they're a nice two plus meters tall, so more than six feet tall and about six meters long, so uh, about 24, 36 feet long. So what ended the Mesozoic? Well, we're not sure, but we have a pretty good idea. At the northwest point of the Yucatan Peninsula, in Mexico, we have the remains of an impact crater, and we call that Chicxulub Crater. That indication of having an asteroid impact isn't only found there, though. When an asteroid hits the Earth, it sends up a lot of dust and debris. And some of that dust is what's called tectites, which are a type of shocked quartz that, when they're found, we know with a great deal of certainty, it's probably due to an extreme impact event because it takes pressure and a sudden blast of heat to form them. We find that tectite material all over the globe in what's called the KT boundary. K for the Cretaceous, T for the tertiary, the following time frame. In the KT boundary, we also find iridium. And iridium is a element that can be found on Earth. It's a mineral we have. But when we find it on Earth, it's normally coming from very deep sources in the mantle. It's not something that's found commonly all over the globe. And in the KT boundary, we suddenly have a very thick layer of iridium. The other source we know of for iridium are asteroids. So in this massive asteroid impact, we lose about half the world's species. The Extinction event that takes out the dinosaurs is actually the best known extinction event in the world today because dinosaurs, we like them. <laughs> we don't want to see them go. But when the dinosaurs died out at this extinction event, we didn't lose everything. We only lost half. We still have flowers. We still have trees. We still have mammals. We have birds, which were really a type of dinosaur that was hyper specialized. We have a lot of reptiles, a lot of sea life. But interestingly enough, 
The sea life changed greatly too during this time frame. And most of the marine reptiles that we had, those ichthyosaurs, the mosasaurs, the plesiosaurs, those go extinct. Why did they go extinct when the ginormous turtles didn't? We don't know that yet. We're still trying to figure that aspect out. But in the aftermath of that impact, the dust entering the atmosphere did cause the Earth to rapidly cool. And as it cooled, changes inevitably took place. And we leave what was known as the age of dinosaurs to enter what becomes known as the age of mammals. But some final caveats. Really quickly, guys, the image of the three animals, do you think they're dinosaurs? Yes, OK. How about that's a, an elephant, a zebra, and a hippopotamus or rhinoceros? Can you tell which one's which? OK, this one might be easily identified as that elephant because of the giant tusks. This image is illustrating one of the major caveats of any image you see for paleontology. There are artist renditions. We don't know what dinosaurs actually look like because things like their skin tone did not preserve in the fossil record, except for some few cases that we found over the years. Things like whether or not they had feathers don't preserve in the fossil record. We don't know how much body fat dinosaurs normally carried. If we drew modern mammals like this artist did in the same way that dinosaurs are drawn, you would not recognize the modern mammal. That's a big problem when we're trying to educate people about dinosaurs, is we're educating them about an idea of dinosaurs that might not be valid. We don't know things like why did the Triceratops have that giant frill? What was its purpose? Was it covered in muscle? Was it covered in fat? We don't know. You go to T-Rex, okay, we start looking at a T-Rex and you go, well, that looks a lot like the crocodile that's next to it, but did it really have that little body fat? Some dinosaurs lived in very cold environments by the end of the Cretaceous. We don't know how much body fat they would have needed to survive, but they obviously could not have had none. If we go back further and look at the plesiosaurs and the mosasaurs, well, those might be realistic. But if you look at the plesiosaur in the far back, this one right here, let's go back to where I had been on my caveats page. That's this guy, if you actually gave it body fat. It all of a sudden looks more recognizably close to a seal. They weren't from the same lineage, but if you're living in deep oceans or even just shallow oceans, you might need body fat to stay warm enough to survive. And these dinosaurs and reptiles were spread across the entire globe. And even though there wasn't a lot of temperature gradient, there was enough that we know that they needed some differences. Other caveats, paleontology is a dynamic field. I gave you pretty firm dates about, oh, 200 million years is when one period ended and the next period began. If you actually look it up online, you will find fuzzy dates where one source you pull up is going to say that something ended at 201. Another place it's going to say 199. We don't actually know because we're basing it off of absolute dating. And with absolute dating, as we get better at doing absolute dating, numbers change. And so the older a resource is, the more likely it is to have out-of-date dates. Newer resources are constantly being updated with what we think the timing actually was. The other thing is that paleontologists are humans, and we fall into two different groups. We're lumpers or we're splitters. <laughs> we either want everything to be grouped together or we want them to all be separated out into nice, neat little piles. So if you go online and you start looking at the different types of ceratops, for example, there are groups that will link all of a variety of ceratops as being different species showing very different evolutionary trends. You can look at that same set of species, though, and find researchers who are saying, actually, this was all one species. What we are seeing is juvenile to adult, the life history change. 
as their frills grow in and they go from having no frills to major frills. So paleontology, it's a very dynamic field. There is a lot of discourse here and it's actually a lot of amateur researchers that make the finds and we get information from them all the time as to what things need to be changed. I think I'm within 45 minutes. Right at. So questions. <laughs> I probably am a lumper more than a splitter. <laughs> so I like the idea that if you look at humans, if I took the skeleton of a child and compared it with the skeleton of an adult, am I going to see that they're significantly the same? There are a lot of similarities, but they might for a splitter actually be enough differences to split them into two different groups. I'd go, and. Uh, Side of caution, let's group them together until we have evidence that they're not together. And for me, the splitters are very much in the, oh no, it's more convenient to have everything be in all its little different spots. And I think that tracks back to the original foundations of paleontology in North America with the situations like um, Marsh, who was getting a lot of funding to go out and make fossil discoveries. Well, he made more money and became more popular the more discoveries he made. So it was more convenient for him to split everything out into all these little bitty groups. And then people came along and were like, actually, that lovely dinosaur that you just called the thunder lizard is the same thing as this dinosaur you'd already discovered who's not a thunder lizard. So you lose the name Brontosaurus from the fossil record. And I'd rather be a little bit more cautious. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Phyllis, if I may, we already okay. have a question here oh, on yes. Zoom. Ms. Ryan, go ahead. How has DNA helped you in splitting or combining? So unfortunately, not as much as we would like it to because the fossils of dinosaurs are old enough that we don't actually have a lot of DNA evidence for any of them. Instead, we have to look at what the bones look like and the climate and environment that the bones were found in to try and make the decisions rather than just what the DNA would tell us. DNA would make it a lot easier. And there are people working on there are people trying to find ancient it. DNA. So yeah. uh, questions from the um, audience here? None? OK. Um, I had one, but I've forgotten it. <laughs> the, cur the curse of age. What can I say? <laughs> well, thank you so much. My pleasure. And Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me today.